Thanks for having me. It's a good time to go along with the rain. And finally, we can actually see the screen, which is also a big advantage of being a little bit darker. So I'm going to try to stay here on the spotlight so you can see the rest of me. So interestingly enough, I was listening to the presentations earlier. I was actually an entrepreneur in the worst possible business in the world. And you can guess what that is? In the music business. I, uh, I worked in digital music for about 10 years. That's after I was a musician and producer. And I had a exit with my company, a very lucrative bankruptcy uh, in 2001. And that taught me a lot about how to start companies. And I realized in 2002 when I was writing my book, my first book called The Future of Music, that I was actually always five years too early with my ideas. And so out of that, I made a job, uh, that, as you can see today. <laughs> years early is a better job than to actually spend money on your ideas five years too early. So the topic of my presentation is looking backwards from the future. And I say looking backwards because I think it's a big difference if we take what we have today and extrapolate into the future, we get more of what we have today, usually. But if we zoom into the future and say what is likely to happen in five years, and, and most of us know what that is, clearly, there's clear trends, and then work backwards of how we're going to participate. I'll give an example. One of my clients is a car company, a big car manufacturer, and it's quite clear that in 10 years, we will be having self-driving, electric, shared, public cars that people use in major cities that drive themselves. So if you accept that as the future, what are you going to do about it? So I work backwards from the future. That's sort of my business model. Uh, you can download this rather elaborate presentation uh, probably have to shortcut a little bit for my Dropbox server that has a fancy name. It's called Good Cloud, but it's basically just Dropbox. Okay, uh, it has a public directory, so you can look up anything you want. Also, my free books are also on there. Don't do it now, please. Do it later, but easy to remember on my website, futurewithgird.com. So, my job description in the, in the best way is this little uh, animation here. I take a lot of different information and and bubbles, and I put them together into what I call a realization. And I do that for my clients to try to get them to understand what is the core of what's happening. Go back to the music business. What is the core of what was happening with the music business? Well, simply, music is moving into the cloud and becoming disembodied, and access is replacing ownership. And that was clear in 1999. But until now, we had solid refusal of this idea. So that resulted, of course, in some pretty good upheaval. The motto of my company is that it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Uh, it's kind of interesting that we say that now because it's raining right now, so we have a good <laughs> occasion to actually stress this. So um, going back to the car idea, what I would like to exercise with you today is let's practice looking five years into the future back on what we're doing now and think about what can happen in the meantime. I'm going to start with a quote by Tim O'Reilly, who's a publisher that you may know, of course, from the U.S., how many U.S. people do we have here? Yeah? Okay, I'm going to do some serious assault on the U.S., so I'll give you a warning shortly coming up. But uh, Tim O'Reilly, who is from America, but nevertheless a nice person, uh, <laughs> work on stuff that matters, he says. And this is the interest right? we're talking about money. This is a good quote to start with. He says, money is like gas in the car. You need it not to get stranded. Without gas, you couldn't drive. But a well-lived life is not a tour of gas stations. Yeah? So I wanted to introduce you to that thought initially. When you're thinking about investment and making money, I was listening to the conversations early, kind of as a warning. <laughs> Point number one, the Internet as we know it is probably over. Okay. And this is tough because, you know, I was involved in the very, very beginning of the Internet. What we have today with about 2.6 billion people online, uh, another 3 billion coming in the next five years, cannot possibly be the same thing that we're going to have in five years. First of all, 80% of the new Internet is mobile. So this means a complete demise of advertising, for example. You know, cookies. How are you going to have cookies across, you know, 20 platforms? And the whole business model of the web, you know, being decentralized and, and so on. I'll give you some more information there shortly. But here's a great example. When you had the terror attacks in Boston, two weeks afterwards, the police was going to Google and looking for people who had surge backpacks and pressure cookers in the same day because the attack was carried out with a backpack and a pressure cooker. And they looked at people and said, who has searched for these terms in the neighborhood of Boston, about 50 miles? They found 150 people, and they sent the terror squad to 150 people who had Googled. 
Okay, this is a reality. This is a real story. Right? So if you had Googled this, you would get a visit from 10 people in, a, in an armored car raiding your house because of what you had Googled. Okay. Now, clearly, this is not the internet that we want or that we grew up with. What is the future of this? Will you have to pay more if your grocery bill is paid with an electric, you know, with a radio frequency chip? Will you have to pay more because your insurer knows that you've bought whiskey and cigarettes? Right. Same thing. So the internet is changing dramatically with this, and clearly, you know, you've seen all the recent stories about what has happened here. An interesting angle. Did you know, in fact, that the advertisers and marketers around the world use exactly the same tracking technologies as the NSA? And the NSA is using similar mechanisms in Facebook. So the mechanisms do, to do the good, in parentheses, are also the same ones to do the bad. Right? So what we have now is, in many ways, we have, you know, if you like to play pinball, you know what this is. Right? We've, we've tilted the box. And we've upset the game, we've kicked the pinball game and tilted it. That's what happens right now. So we have this huge debate, as I'm sure you're aware of. The European Commission wants to build its own internet, where information from Europe cannot go to America unless they agree to how it would go. The Brazilians have the same idea. Of course, that's an illusion. No, that's technically not really feasible. But what we're seeing here is clearly we're living in a military term here, the VUCA world, which is volatility, ambiguity, uncertainty, and complexity. And that's our future, in a nutshell. Out of, that, out of this, I would see a ton of opportunities, but also challenges. I lived in America for 13 years, and in America, of course, the philosophy is, by and large, if there is a problem, we'll invent something to fix it, uh, which is great. You know, that's how new ideas are being born. But what is coming out of this wave, you know, this, this stack of waves of opportunities in this VUCA world is things like this, you know, where we, uh, years ago we had Star Trek with a tricorder. Now we got this guy, um, his name is, uh, I think, Andraka, who is uh, about to win the X Prize challenge to build such a tricorder that you can cough into and prick your finger and will give you a better diagnosis than your doctor anywhere in the world. So, and this is a funny part, you know, if you're a little bit into science fiction, like movies or books, you realize a lot of that stuff that we taught, laughed about is actually real now. In many ways, it's so scarily real, like the story with Google and the, and the pressure cooker. It could be straight out of a Cory Doctorow novel, what we're seeing today. And we're only at the very beginning. In terms of technology changing our society, we're at 0 0.1.5 of 500, right, in terms of that change that's coming. So there's great opportunities and challenges coming up. For example, if you look at all the stuff that we saw in the movies like uh, uh, Total Recall with my friend Schwarzenegger, you know, the, the Johnny Cab that drives itself, we have that now. We have the Google car as a taxi. We don't have that yet. I'll be here shortly. Las Vegas is working on this. We're living in a time of exponential growth. If you're an investor, this is fantastic. Very high risk, very high opportunity. But exponential growth has something that's driving it right now, and that is, by and large, artificial intelligence. And with that, I mean smart machines, ultra-intelligent software, software agents, prediction software, automated search, voice gesture control, and so on and so on. Kind of science fiction-y, which I'll ex explain a little bit more shortly. We have already seen this that, of course, in our reality is quite clear. Mobile devices are our external brain. As Marshall McLuhan said, 1974, the extension of man. In fact, you could argue that without our mobiles, we're basically, you know, we're basically not functional. We're sort of impotent. Uh, if we can't look up something on our mobile device, we're not fully functional. Think about this five years from now. If we don't have Google Glass as a professor, you're screwed. Right? You can't look up your live feed about data. If you're meeting somebody at a trade show, you don't have Google Glass, you're disadvantaged, just like you don't have a mobile. So these devices are becoming our external brains. And we're moving into a world that I call connected, intelligent, everything. And as investors and entrepreneurs, of course, this is a gold mine, clearly. Because all the cool stuff we can, we can invent is based on this basic assumption. 
I was uh, in uh, Zanzibar, Tanzania, to, to visit my son who worked there a couple months ago. And when I got there, I realized I was always on the cloud, sucking stuff off the cloud. You know, my, of course, my emails, but also my intelligence, my news, my videos, everything. When I got there, I realized there is no cloud there, right? Didn't work. It's GPRS. So I'm just gonna, I, I, I stopped to exist, basically. Right? And this is a little piece of our future. So connected, intelligent, everything means connected traffic lights. Los Angeles just put 4,700 traffic lights on a network. And doing that, they can save 10% of gas and pollution on every morning commute by connecting all those traffic lights. Cr uh, credit cards that connect to the internet, the fridge that connects to the internet, the uh, mobile applications for traveling, the connected car, the screens and advertising, connected learning, we talked about that I think yesterday, connected credit cards, connected books. Uh, books with hyperlinks is what we have now with the Kindle. The connected watch, I don't know why you would ever buy such a thing, but people do seem to want it. And of course, radio frequency chips and connected uh, communications with the green grid and so on and so on. A connected street light. This is our reality. Eh? This street light will know when you've passed because of your Bluetooth Mac address, like the garbage bin already does. Eh? This street light will know what the weather is and how much pollution there is and so on and so on and so on. Right? So think about what this will do for our privacy. Think of the gold mine for advertisers and for the police at the same time, or for anybody else who cares to crack it. Right? Connected credit cards again. So we're moving into a world like this, which is basically hyper-connected and peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized. Well, decentralized not quite. I'll talk about that shortly. But in this world, we have variables course, wearable computing, and we have what's called invisibles, which is invisible computing, because once you have a Wikipedia brain implant, which is feasible, nobody will know that you have one. I mean, you can have an Alzheimer's brain implant, it works, right? It keeps people outside of their zone of attack. So this is happening, DIY medicine, the quantified self, telemedicine, all great places to invest in, clearly. Maybe not the quantified slave, as I call it, but the quantified self, very interesting. The Internet of Things, like this device called the Nest, I'm sure you've heard about, connects your house to the, to the smart grid and with the others that are using it. Now there's discussion in California to make it mandatory because people that use this, we could save 40% of energy if we're using a smart system, a smart meter, to control our devices and to compare how we can save. So the Internet of Things is the next really big wave of connected devices that is going to be extremely powerful. But here's the problem. We're living in this really hyper-connected world, but our business models are disconnected to a very large degree because we're only focusing on what we are doing. We're only focusing on a tiny piece of that slice without thinking about the larger story. And this is the demise of publishing, the music business, and banking because thinking only of your one slice. Can you hear me okay with this thing? Seems like it's dropping out a little bit. Do we have battery problems? My battery is fine, but maybe this device. So, to take it a little bit further out, working on a new book that's on this topic, but essentially what we're seeing here is that we're taking this invariable term in what I call the future of capitalism, which will take about five days to explain, but essentially taking a turn from what I call an ecosystem to an ecosystem, so a biosphere of connected businesses. If you're looking at the successful businesses in the last 10 years, they've all done this. They have created new ecosystems, whether it's in telecom or in media like Netflix or Amazon, with the publishing, with Kindle. I mean, it's clearly becoming a shift to this idea of a biosphere and then we have the anti-shift of this, like this is Brazil, this is uh, Jima Rousseff saying, you know, she hates Obama because of the spying that was done on her personally by the NSA. So we have this rift of companies and, and of course continents, as you can see here, wanting to own the internet themselves. So I call this ultra-exponential change. I'm going to use Ray Kurzweil's exponentiality 
we take it one step further, ultra exponential. Okay. These terms here are becoming reality, ultra fast, ultra mobile, ultra intelligent. This is very scary when you think about it, what that means. Can machines actually become sentient? You know, can they become conscious because they're intelligent? Ultra-connected, convenient, transparent, ultra-addictive. I mean, it's completely clear that we're completely addicted to technology. And many business plans that I see, they are addiction devices. There's nothing wrong with that. A, a car is an addiction, or drinking coffee is an addiction, right? But think about that for a second. How much money can you make with a company that's built on the premise of building a mousetrap? which most addictions are. Take it one step further. The content business, where I worked in for a long time, we can see this exponentiality at work. YouTube has 1.1 billion users. 1.1 billion is the biggest broadcaster in the world. What's happening here is that because of this exponential technology is that attention is replacing distribution. And this is a revolution, of course, for media. You still need distribution, of course. You know, if you're going to watch a football game with 100 million people, you can't do it on the mobile. Not yet. Right? So that's, there's a window there. Right? So interesting enough, for example, what happens to advertising here is that advertisers that are based on disruption won't survive. That's a billion-dollar industry. Huge shift. If you want to invest somewhere, invest in the future of advertising because that's about to change very radically, just like the music business. So we have this fragmentation. Can we change this microphone? It keeps, keeps dropping out or something. You guys there over there? OK. I mean, I can probably fill the space here without the microphone, but it's kind of annoying. If you have another one, I'll take another one. So we see this fragmentation happening in, in what I call the information monopolies. Do you have another one? Okay. Sorry, guys. Apologize to the to the entire world. That's all 24 people who are watching the webcast. You know, I'm just kidding. It's probably at least 27. Would be probably more uh, cutting edge than my talk. <laughs> you can just stick in my pocket if you want. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, so here's the problem in media. It's not that we don't want to watch television or read a newspaper. It's that the information monopoly is, is toast. I mean, we're watching television. We can also watch another 50 channels of over-the-top stuff. And, you know, why would you do that if you have a choice? I mean, it's not that we have court cutters. We have court nevers. You know, who never sign up for, for cable? I mean, cable nevers. You know, who never actually sign up for it? So information monopoly is toast. As you can see, you know, Americans are turning to Netflix to watch everything online. What happens to advertising here? This is a huge shift to uh, attention, not distribution. Sorry, wrong button here. So, and then we have this effect. I think this is, you know, if you want to invest somewhere else or do a startup, this is a good turf. Now with Twitter going public, this is even better turf. The internet has turned into a giant fire hose of stuff. And now that we have the Brazilians and Chinese and all the Africans and all everyone else in the world coming online, this flood of information, this noise is going to be explosive. Think about all the books that are awaiting us when we have automatic translation, which is here. So all the Chinese can publish books and we can read them in German or Finnish or Swiss German for that matter. So think about what we need then and then think about what's happening with mobile is that the mobile phone, as I was saying earlier, is in fact running our lives. As this cartoon aptly shows, you know, we think we're running it, but it's actually kind of running us. So in this future, that is bound to be extremely noisy and multifaceted and, and complex, we need this. Right? We need filters, humanizers, sense makers, curators, interfaces. Well, that kind of sounds like a publisher, doesn't it? <laughs> well, we need tools and people who do this more than before. And this is a really f uh, fertile area. As I was uh, looking earlier at some of the presentations, a company like Paperly, which is in Switzerland, is uh, one of those examples that makes sense out of the fire hose. 
So I, I think making sense of the fire out of the fire hose is a $50 billion business because it applies to all media and it applies to advertising. And the fire hose is kind of unavoidable. The thing that's happened with free content, of course, as we now find out, right, we didn't pay, so we became the content. Right? We are the show of Facebook, you know, we are the content of Facebook, and we are the content of the NSA. Right? I mean, we, we are the ones who are actually providing the show there, in, in, in all of those cases. And I think that's going to change in the future, because as this slide shows, you know, the song goes, you ain't seen nothing yet, because what we're going to see is a huge explosion of data, computing power, smart software, artificial intelligence, and the sharing velocity. Again, we're only at 1.5 out of 500. Imagine if you feel like you're confused today because you're getting 550 messages and, and huge Twitter and all these things, so what the future holds for you here. It can't possibly be that because we used a digital technology that we're actually worse off than before with constant overload and you know never really any time to catch up anything. So that's a huge thing. I think interface revolutions, speaking to devices, this is becoming a standard. Speaking to your computer and search, like Google has already done this. Gesture control, blinking. I mean, think about this consequence. Type, speak, gesture, blink, think. That's where we're going. The last point is a tough point. Thinking and computing will become the same thing. I don't really know what to think of this, uh, <laughs> if I can still think when I can blink or whatever. But in any case, I think what we're seeing here is a vast amount of innovation, many of them driven by this monster. Not Godzilla, but big data. There's a lot of talk about big data because it's sort of like social media. Now when you use the headline, you can make money speaking about it. But Big data is a huge driver of all of these things because data now is becoming the currency. When you think about this, I looked at the, the other day, when you're looking at all your Google searches and the Gmail and all the location sharing from the last seven years I did, it's quite likely that Google knows me better than my wife right? <laughs> but because of all the explicit data that's in there. I mean, you don't, you don't talk to people and say, I, I Googled for fungus cream or something, right? But if you have all this stuff together, this information is huge. Right? Think about that. I mean, think about what can be done or not be done with that information. So it's indeed like oil. I think the data economy will be bigger than the oil economy. The fossil fuel economy is, of course, roughly owned by four companies, just like the record labels. <laughs> It's roughly $3.8 trillion a year. And we're completely hooked on that. I mean, it's unavoidable for the time being. Data is going to take over that slot as a key driver of economy. Because we're producing it all, it's endless, and it doesn't have side effects. Not yet. So I think this is why it's very important that we don't create more BPs and Exxon Mobiles in the data business. We don't want companies to be able to do what BP has done, which is to take everything, give nothing back, and destroy us in the process. So when we talk about big data, we're going to need some sort of way of figuring out how this can actually benefit the entire system. And this is what we're doing right now, of course, in the current debates about what's happening with search engines and privacy and data and all that stuff. So here's our good friend, uh, General Alexander. Uh, the main culprit behind the current data crisis. And if you're looking for more information, you can use my hashtag data wars to find out more <coughs> what's happening and why this is relevant to your business, because it doesn't look like it from the outside, but it is. He's built himself a, uh, this is the architect's screenshot. He's built himself a Star Trek type command center. And um, the, the header of his office is the information dominance center. That is what he calls his office. There you can see what's happening with data. I mean, the holy grail of all that stuff, as you know, I'm sure you're looking at every single day, prediction, anticipation, and meta-intelligence. Because you can safely predict what people will buy when you have enough data. You can predict if I should marry you because your DNA is different than mine, right? Costs $800 each. 
is it useful? Is, there, is that a business or is it just plain creepy? This is stuff that's happening all over the world. So what we're seeing here today, and I think this is really important to look at, is what I call data greed. So just like the oil companies basically controlled everything, including our politics, now we're seeing the same thing happen with data. And I would propose to you that this is not a good business because it's abusive. When you abuse the consumer with their data, regardless of the fact how good Google or Facebook is, eventually we get pissed off. I mean, if you ask people in the UK, are they okay with being surveilled by the GSHQ or whoever, most of them say, well, it's okay because, you know, they keep the terrorists away from me. You ask Germans, they're all completely different. So it's a cultural question. But what we're seeing here is that data greed has driven the sort of first wave of what's happening with data. Advertisers want better feeds to sell more stuff. Governments want more information. This is sort of a one-way street. It's a bit of a uh, stopgap, I think. So, for example, garbage cans in London that scan for Bluetooth, if you have an open Bluetooth connection, they will find out who you are and your MAC address of your phone. And they will keep that data and compare how many times you've gone by. They don't know it's you, but they know it's a device. That's metadata, right? meta intelligence. So abusing shared data is not a business model. I, I see many business models where this is the business plan. We're going to use the fact that most consumers are acting like idiots. We're going to use that to create a business model. Not a good idea. In fact, I would propose that if Facebook doesn't change their stance on these things, we'll be looking at face toast in three years. This is the biggest problem. Why would we keep on trusting them? Same goes for Google. So uh, global privacy failure, now we, we have sort of privacy failure now. If you've watched uh, Minority Report, you can take the red pill or the blue pill. The so red pill will show you what's actually happening. The blue pill, you stay happy and don't know what's happening. That's not a good choice. Because in the end, all of us, none of us can go off the grid. I mean, if we weren't using LinkedIn or all the other stuff that we're used to, our business would be a lot harder. We can't actually get off the grid. So this is kind of a failure that we have to look at. And so ultimately, I think if our future evolves in this direction to where we are becoming by default naked and transparent and we can't do much about it, then I would say uh, the question is, do we have to end all privacy to maintain a perfect illusion of security? And if you're making a business model out of this, not a good idea. I mean, as President Obama said himself, you can't be 100% private and 100% secure. So his consequence is you'll be 100% naked and 1% private. 1% uh, secure. <laughs> I can't see the logic behind this. I mean, this is an artificial choice, of course. We know this, you know, in the end, technology, good technology, should not enforce a yes or no behavior. It's a question of, the answer is, it depends. So technology has to be flexible enough for me to allow to use it when I need it, but not make me a slave of it. That would be like I buy a car, and in return, I cut my legs off because I only drive. Right? Makes no sense. And this is a fake choice that's been given to us by, by politics, of course, this idea of saying that we're either on or we're not on. Right? And it shouldn't be that way. So that's kind of a system failure. So in many ways, you can say that in the last five years, we've been starting to boil the frog. And that's kind of a term for saying that you put the frog in the I mean, don't do this, it's just an ex explanation. Huh? You put the frog in the, in, the, uh, in the pan and then you gradually turn up the heat. The frog doesn't know it's gradually turning up, right? Because it's gradual. But nevertheless, he ends up being fried. So what we have done with consumers is two and a half billion of them, we've boiled the frog. We've been cranking up the heat with advertising, with surveillance, with elaborate business model, with, with the mouse traps, you know, with all the fancy stuff we invent. But in the end, we're doing this. And I would basically say, in the future, we can't do any of this. Because it's becoming apparent that we've been boiling. I mean, if you're looking at what people are saying around the world, you know, this kind of Faustian bargain that we have, for example, with Google. I mean, I love all the Google products. Google is a client. 
But if we're going to do a Faustian pact, which means that we sell something to get something, it better be good and revocable. Right? I mean, we have to be empowered in this. Otherwise, I think the future is like this. This phone, crypto phone, you can buy. It's the first phone that does not broadcast your location, and it's encrypted. And they have a waiting list that you would go goes from here to Madrid. Right? And it's going to cost some 3,000 euros. Now, there is a business to invest in. The rich people can be private again. Right? I mean, if you're looking at all that whole sector, right, you can buy your privacy by having fancy tools. And what happens here also with advertising is that this used to be the old paradigm of advertising. You know, dazzle them, addict them, flood them, and then sell them. That's kind of a rough description, though, of course. There's a great quote by Peter Drucker who says, uh, the greatest danger in times of change and turbulence is not the change itself, but to act with yesterday's logic. If you're going to invest in companies today or start a company, don't do this. That's yesterday's logic. Right? Yesterday's logic is you do whatever you can to exploit the system, and then it's YB, YBG, IBG, right? you'll be gone, I'll be gone after you're gone. Won't work. It's too late. We have to think of it in a larger way. So here, I mean, it's a little bit hard to see from the back there, but we can see the total reset of advertising as a result. I just did a conference on this yesterday, so it's a fresh topic. In fact, we can see that the advertisers are looking to become superpowers you know, in terms of getting data, just like the NSA is looking to become a superpower. There's lots of parallels there. So I think we're going to see this is a billion, uh, $650 billion a year industry, advertising. We're going to see the rebirth of advertising as non-abusive, meaningful, relevant, wanted, personalized service. And that is happening in the next three years. And I think there's quite a few startups here working on this when I was watching the presentations earlier. Very powerful business. The other thing is it's quite certain that we're going to start paying for privacy. What we have done in the first generation of the Internet is we said anything that's free and cool we'll use because it has to be free. And we all did this, right? So BitTorrent is cool because, you know, but now Netflix is cooler. And it's better and it's cheap. And Spotify is better than YouTube. So now we're switching to this idea of saying, well, maybe we'll pay to make it better. Or we'll, we'll pay to make it private. And this is a basis, for example, this guy's here from AdTracks. It's a box you can buy. $130 will buy you a box that cuts off all of the ads on your video streams in your house system. All of it, audio and video, and lets you watch all of YouTube without ads, for example. It's a box that filters out the ads. Right? Our own cloud, which I just installed, is like Dropbox, but runs on your own server. So you see in this trend towards paying for privacy, basically this idea of saying, OK, you're going to pay is less free, but more private. That's a growth business. In fact, I don't know why somebody doesn't start a Facebook that's paid. It does not have investors. I've been thinking about it. I'm kind of busy, but it seems like an interesting opportunity. Because would I pay 20 bucks a year like I pay for Flickr to do what Facebook does without ads, without investors, right? without being sold out, essentially? I mean, I'm a Facebook user, so I'm consenting to it, right? But still. OK, for the Americans in the room, sorry, guys. I lived in America for 14 years. I went to school in America. And now we're observing with the current situation what's happening is that Pretty much anywhere in the world, we have this thumbs down for what America is doing. And, and the big shift here is, of course, now in technology is that most of the innovation still comes from there, clearly. That's why we're here. Right? But there's what I call a shift opportunity. For example, in cloud computing, there's already people predicting we have a, a shift of $35 billion a year to Europe for secure cloud computing in countries where well, they don't have the Patriot Act and FISA courts. I mean, it's obvious. Right? I live in Switzerland. I told the Swiss government, you guys can make 20 billion out of this if you act quickly. It's obvious. Right? And it won't happen. It won't change in America for quite some time, at least that's how I look at it. So we're seeing the shift opportunity here in the fact, for example, that all of the big platforms on the web are American, but most of the users are not. 
80% of most of the users are actually international users. So imagine what happens if we shift that over to those platforms. Of course, in the end, we have to say nothing is really as good as what Google is doing with search. <laughs> there is no alternative for Google search. Maybe one of you can solve that problem. And, and so we have this whole thing about cloud computing. I think this is a fantastic opportunity for European businesses, this shift opportunity. And then Alvin Toffler, uh, the uh, most, probably most famous futurist, he talks about what's happening with the knowledge revolution. And this is also, I think, not just in knowledge like education, but also business intelligence. We're seeing the third level of the revolutions, the knowledge revolution and the human resource revolution. This is, was actually a slide from the 60s. So he talks about this and, and says, you know, we're seeing essentially the shift from this industrial mindset that many of us grew up with, in essentially production-oriented, uh, uh, to a connected mindset, selling things that are mostly virtual. So in this, we have the shift to digital exponential. It's, a, it's truly a knowledge revolution. Education, business intelligence, big data, e-commerce, mobile, it's all driven by this basic fact. Now, McKinsey has a great study that you can reach called, uh, it's called the, the uh, Disruptive Trends or so from McKinsey Institute. It's about 80 pages. One of them talks about what's happening with the automation of knowledge work. I mean, think about this for a second. Artificial intelligence, natural user interface, big data technologies. If you're a data enter or an analyst, software will take your job. If you're a cab driver, robot will take your job. If you're a checkout clerk, our fits will take your job. There are some people predicting that we may lose as many as one billion jobs to automation. And there's only 3.5 billion jobs in the world. So every third job. And this is all going to happen in the next five years. So you can be a driver behind this and invent these cool uh, things, right? Or you can also deal with the consequence, which is what are we going to do with those people? <laughs> Will they have a guaranteed minimum income? Which is what we're debating in Switzerland. I'm not going to get into that because it would take the next three days here. But So what is starting to happen here is the creation of a knowledge cloud, uh, what Marshall McLuhan calls the global brain and the global village. And here in this knowledge cloud, we have the answer to a lot of large-scale uh, problems, for example, virus and uh, inventing of medicine and so on and so on and crowdsourcing and all these trends that we're seeing. That's all part of the knowledge cloud. So if I had a dollar to spend, I would put it here first. Because this is clearly an area that is going to be absolutely needed, no matter how you look at it, and that's already widely at swing. And the other thing is that we're seeing now the incumbents like banks or insurance companies uh, or financial or consulting companies like KPMG and others, eh? they're in deep trouble with this now because all of a sudden the information superiority is, is toast. I mean, do I talk to my bank about where I should invest? I mean, I, I can just use software to find that. <laughs> I mean, I can go to uh, tweet uh, stock, and, and they will tell me what, what will rise tomorrow, and they're pretty accurate. So information superiority is not a sustainable advantage. We're, talk we're talking about this at lunch earlier, and basically what's happening here is that this idea of getting information is replaced by the idea of wisdom, right? by having human information that actually has gone through all that data. It's one step beyond this. So this is why, uh, for example, education is going to be completely digitized, textbooks on mobile devices, peer-to-peer -peer learning, videos, certifications. Huge trend there. So as I was saying earlier, in this sort of knowledge revolution, we're moving from, from data and information and, and just you know, cut and paste learning like we did at university. You, know, you learn this for later, and then you forget it. Yeah. We're moving to a different kind of learning, which is this network paradigm is explaining you know, from data to information to knowledge to wisdom, and we're moving in this direction here. So basically, all of the value is concentrating here on knowledge and, and wisdom rather than data. And this is the path that Twitter is going. Yeah. You know where Twitter is now, right? It's not even on this chart. It's, it's up here, it's a perpetual noise generator hamster wheel. Yeah. I'm very happy to use it. Yeah. I mean, I, I love Twitter, but you know, there's a long path for those guys to end up down here, which is 
The Guardian, for example. But The Guardian is losing $20 million a year. So, so what is the business model for that? But clearly, this is the trend of where we're going, and that's also the place to invest. If, if, you, if you can't ever get down here, don't spend a dollar, because the rest is just noise. So more, more signal, less noise. And then we have this overlap of human and machines. I talked about this earlier, Ray Kurzweil, who I like to uh, quote because I, I don't agree with most of what he's saying. But watch his movie called The Transcendent Man if you want to get really worried about the future. <laughs> watch his movie. And here's a quote from him. He says, the search engines won't wait for us to ask for information. They will know you like a friend, aware of your concerns and interests at a detailed level. We can replace this and say they'll know you like an enemy, if you, if you wish. But this is already happening. Right? Google Now, that's what they do. In less than two years, we're not going to be searching anything. Information will come to us based on our profile and our complex profiles, you know, better than my wife profiles. Right? I mean, this is technology-wise, it's all already there. So it's about, this is about social issues. So, a great place to look at for investments, also for starting stuff, is that dramatic evolution of this human-machine relationships. How does this all go together? <laughs> because exponential technology means what used to be so cost prohibitive two years from now is going to be less than a cup of espresso. I mean, think about DNA analysis, 100,000 euros five years ago, now 800. Three years, $50. So what happens here is dramatic in terms of change. And if you've seen this movie, Robert and Frank, take a look right, to see which way this is going. Robots are already doing elder care. Right? These robots are now being sold for $5,000. They used to be $100,000. You have a, a grandmother who can't lift herself out of bed. You can get the robot to do it. Is that socially acceptable? I don't know. Be my guest to figure this out. But basically, I think there's a bit of a reset that we have to do inside of our heads. As I was saying, going backwards from the future. If we go forward from today, then we're going to say, you know, we'll get smarter mobiles and we have better data and we have more privacy. You know, it's all kind of obvious. But if we go backwards from the future in five years, you know, we will have machines that will do a lot of that work for us. And we can then move into a different direction. Right? Can we bring up the sound a little bit? Just bring me some cereal. That cereal is full of unhealthy ingredients. I threw it away. Don't throw away my stuff. Frank, that cereal is for children. Enjoy this grapefruit. You're for children, stupid. Today we're going to start a garden. Oh, fuck this shit. Frank, you need a project. Mental stimulation plus okay, a regimented... Okay, watch the movie, you'll see. Another example is this one. It's actually better. Can you fly that thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Well, you've seen this scene, so it's obviously going to be a while before that happens, right? But it's only a marginal difference when you think about that I will use Google Glass to summon up information while I'm talking to you. So I'll, I'll appear even cleverer than I am now because I'm connected with this thing and it will give me feedback from you. I'll be a lot better than the other guy who doesn't have it. This is only a gradual step forward. So what we'll need for this, and this is the flip side of technology, right? while you're busy inventing the next mousetrap, you, know, you can also think about how uh, machines and humans actually require new social contracts because that's what it's about. Right? What is acceptable? What of that use of data is acceptable? I was telling yesterday the advertisers at this summit that in the future to do any advertising, we're going to need a digital bill of rights, like a bill of, because it's a human right to be private, right? So if we don't have that, we can't actually use this technology because we'll always be getting to those points where people are saying, oh, this is really creepy, I hate you. And other ones are saying, this is really cool, I love you, right? So what do we do? So how is that a business model? So while you're working on technology, I would encourage you to look at exponential technology process, you know, as Google calls it, 10x thinking. I'm sure you heard that before, right? Clearly makes sense. 
But look at human issues. Because in the end, you will be successful as a company by based on human success, not on machines talking to machines, you know, un unless you're a machine yourself. So it's about the balance. I mean, if we're looking at this, you know, many sort of mechanical jobs will shift to smart software aid engines. And the likes of Google and others are working on that. I mean, the Google self-driving car could easily uh, be erasing about 27 million jobs of drivers. I mean, it won't happen in Rome, you know, it'd be too complex, or, but Singapore, Beijing, yeah. I mean, here's a long list, you know, of people who would be kicked out of this food chain, you know, accountants and clerks and tax preparers and, I mean, think about the entire audit industry. What, what, that's a software job, isn't it? As far as I can see. I mean, there's a human component to it, but, you know. So there'll be lots of changes coming up there. And uh, the futurist friend of mine, uh, Thomas Fry, he says 47% uh, of U.S. jobs are at risk of being automated away. There's a good side to this. I'll get to it in a second before you hear uh, wilt and shock, right? So what that means for us is that we're moving back to what we can actually do best, which is not to just focus on the left brain and constant rows of numbers and equations, but on the right brain, okay? on design, on interface, on negotiation, on things that can be done only by us because we're, we're not a machine, a human-only task. I mean, investing is such a task. Right? Because if you could run a spreadsheet and then say, okay, clearly I'm going to be rich if I invest in these guys, you know, then you can just use, use a spreadsheet. Right? But it's not. It's a much more interactive process in this. Right? So basically, human-only tasks on top of smart data. Of course, those jobs won't be available for everyone because hard for a cab driver to do this kind of job, clearly. So. We're heading into a future to where these, uh, from the 16th century, from Henri uh, Poincaré, he says that logic proves, but intuition discovers. And I think this is what investing is all about. When I was in position, it was quite clear, you know, it's logical to play this, but is it good? You know, right? That's art and craft, that's two different things. So I think this is important to keep in mind. Also what Marshall McLuhan said in that context, kind of a, a scary reminder. First we build the tools, then they build us. This is something we don't want with the technology that we're building now. And there's a lot of debate about this. I mean, clearly this is something to keep a good eye on. Machines don't have ethics. Technology doesn't have ethics. And some technologies don't have ethics. <laughs> I'm not going to go any further. So the question there is, you know, how does this make sense in the long run, not just financially, but also otherwise? Uh, and the singularity poses such a question to me. Uh, singularity is the point of when humans and machines are converging. That's the point of singularity. That's essentially thinking of humans as machines. I think it's a dead end, to be frank. But nevertheless, you know, using machines is, is our reality. But maybe not in this way. So let's go back to the beginning and then we'll wrap up with some questions. The concept of uh, business becoming more like a biosphere. I mean, this is, you can see this clearly every single day. This is why we have government shut down in America, because it's not a biosphere. Right? It's basically an ego, an ego system, not an ecosystem. Right? I mean, it's, that's not a bad thing about Americans. This is a, a problem overall, right? So let's not focus on just that. Right? But as Tiffany Schlein points out in her movie, Connected, right, we're now living in a world where everything is connected. What you're inventing, somebody else is working on. What you're inventing here may be uh, useful in, in China for a month and then be uh, possible in Australia and move around the world in such a way so that we have a situation where we're facing what's called interdependence. And we're living in an interdependent world. I've been working on my book From Ego to Eco for three years. Three months ago, a researcher from MIT published a book called From Ecosystem to Ecosystem that he's been working on for 10 years. Now, if you Google ego to eco, you find me, not his book. Right? But my book is toast. Right? Because what he writes about is exactly what I wanted to write. Right? Because we're interdependent. 
We don't live on a separate place. So when you're investing in technology, you have to think of the consequences and the ecosystem, not just one of the trees. That was okay 15 years ago, or even five years ago. As politics are aptly proven, Turkey's prime minister said when the riots were happening that social media is a menace to society. And look what you have in Turkey now, which is a complete unresolved situation that nobody knows what's happening next, and definitely not joining the European Union. <laughs> While in Brazil, you have the same problem, and Gima Rousseff says, I salute the protest, I put the, bu the bus fare back to what it was, and we'll talk through Twitter about how we can solve this problem. She's thinking about interdependence, and he's thinking about independence, like his own independence won't work. And this is just an example from politics, but it's very much the same. So as we are approaching this situation, this is the Osani tribe in, in Africa. Um, they are playing a game there, and it's basically uh, the realization of this is that our ecosystems are built on value circles, not value chains. When you go to business school, which I thankfully didn't have the pleasure to, uh, you talk about value chains. And there, there's no value chain. Because it just ends. The chain ends eventually. We need a value cycle. This is nicely expressed by Umay Haik in his book about the 21st century capitalism. And a company like Patagonia is doing this. Patagonia advertised three years ago in the US with a huge campaign that you may have seen that says, don't buy this jacket. That was the head of the campaign. It says, if you have a jacket, send it to us. We'll fix it. If you're tired of it, sell it for used on eBay, and you can swap. And if you don't have another choice, buy a jacket. Okay. Result, the last three years, 15% more sales per year. Now, it sounds like a gimmick, right? But they believe in it. And so does Unilever when they're saying, our products may be more, more expensive, but we're trying to do the right thing with our logistics and supplies. Electric cars make a great example. Tomorrow, somebody, uh, today, somebody talked about Tesla. Right? So what we have here is that our opportunity, for example, is to build tomorrow's ecosystem, not to replicate yesterday's ecosystem or ego system or amend it. Why do you think the likes of BMW and Audi and Volvo are so worried about the electric car? Because in the end, it's not about cars. It's about mobility. So this ecosystem is a huge opportunity. This is why Google is playing in this turf. Google is not a car company. Google is not going to build those cars. Google is scaring the wits out of the other guys to get going. Huh? The rising tide floats all boats, and what are you going to do in your self-driving car? You use Google, right? Makes sense. So building tomorrow's ecosystem is what you should be investing in. You can invest in today's ecosystem and you make some money, but this is a big story. Right? Renewable energy, self-driving cars, the new forms of media. I already talked about this. So I want to sign off with a quote from my friend Albert here, Albert Einstein, that I met at the Wax Museum. Uh, he looks kind of old, but uh, he, he didn't say much. But he said, uh, creativity is the residue of time wasted. I think this is no more, more important than today, when we're always looking to not waste time so we can be more efficient. Right? And I think this is a trap that goes back to what I was saying earlier about machine thinking. Uh, we are thinking that if we are fast and efficient machines, we can make more money, but the truth is, of course, it's the reverse. I'm sure you know that if you're a successful investor, that's not the way it works. Okay. So I want to leave you this, with this thought, and uh, thanks for your attention. You can download this uh, slideshow when I get online sometime tonight in Karakes. Uh, go to uh, futurewithgert.com to download this. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you.